All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alberto Vargas. I'm the Associate Director of the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Jean-Michel Annet from the Department of Bacteriology and Agronomy to present his work on nitrogen fixation in maize land races from Oaxaca in, in Mexico. Uh, corn is a very, very important crop in Mexico and in other parts in, in Mesoamerica. It, only in Mexico, there's more than 7 million hectares that are uh, cultivated in corn with a production of over 27 million uh, tons. Uh, and also just to want to remind um, the audience that um, uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison has had like a very long uh, time collaboration with colleagues in, in Mexico uh, since the uh, publication of the article in Science uh, about the, the cataloging of Cia diploperennis, the uh, Theo Simple in 1979, who gave uh, a place to this collaboration with the University of Guadalajara in the Sierra de Manatlan that is still ongoing. And uh, we, we hope that this um, collaboration with Professor Anne will give uh, place to, uh, to another fruitful, fruitful collaboration with, with this. So Professor Anne uh, got his degrees from the University of Toulouse in France, and he's been at UW with us since 2004. Um, so we're, uh, Professor Anne is gonna give his presentation for about um, probably 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll just have time for Q&A, please put your questions in the chat or at the time we can also, you can also unmute your, your mic and, and your question. Uh, I'm also asking you to do the, please fill out the, uh, fill out the questionnaire, the evaluation that is being put now in the chat um, after the, the uh, Professor Anne's presentation. So without uh, further ado, I uh, just uh, give a welcome to Professor Annette. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, this um, invitation um, to talk about some of our work on nitrogen fixation. And in particular, this work is, um, as you said, based on um, the uh, identification and characterization of um, what we call land races of maize grown in, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, so before, to start my my talk, I, I want to give you a little bit of background on nitrogen in agriculture um, and why we care about nitrogen fixation in particular. So most plants um, take their nitrogen from the soil, mostly in the form of what we call nitrate and, and ammonium. What we call nitrogen fixation is the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium. And that chemical reaction can be performed by in different ways. You can have industrial nitrogen fixation, also called the haber bosch process, after the, the name of the two German scientists who invented that process at the beginning of the 20th century. And that process allows us to produce um, synthetic fertilizers. Um, the use of synthetic fertilizers is a key uh, now of our uh, of agriculture in many parts of the world since the Green Revolution. It's one of the central innovations um, that allows very high yield um, in developing countries. In developed countries, um, in, uh, in addition to that industrial fixation, so a chemical, pro a physical chemical process, there is also what, uh, that conversion of dinitrogen from the air into ammonium uh, that happens when you have lightnings. Uh, that's what we call atmospheric nitrogen fixation. And then you have what we call biological nitrogen fixation, which is performed by bac bacteria and archaea. And some plants, like plants of the legume family, are really good at associating with some of these nitrogen fixing bacteria that sometimes we call diazotrophs. Um, the legumes associate with bacteria called rhizobia, and that association, association is very efficient. And that's why you have legumes in all our cropping systems around the world. Um, in, in the US or in the Midwest, yeah, I would say it's um, soybean and, and corn. Uh, you see the soybeans here, you see soybeans in Asia too. Uh, when you go to Mesoamerica, that's common bean. Uh, 
um, which is the main legume, or um, if you go to France or Europe, uh, it's going to be uh, pea. Uh, peas are going to be uh, central to, to the cropping systems. So um, legumes are really good at associating with these um, bacteria. Unfortunately, most of, of our cereal crops like maize, uh, wheat, uh, rice, are not, uh, do not associate very efficiently with these bacteria. And in addition, these crops require a very large amount of nitrogen to, to sustain yield and to have good yield. So it has been a long dream of my community and in fact of research uh, for more than 100 years. I could actually show you, uh, I have a, there's a paper from the University of Illinois from the beginning of the 20th century already saying we need to improve the association between these bacteria and, and cereals in particular. So I'm gonna, uh, at the beginning, uh, tell you a li little bit more about nitrogen fixation and why we care uh, about uh, improving biological nitrogen fixation in, uh, in cereals in particular. Then I'm gonna tell you about um, the, uh, the, uh, the characterization of some of these land races of maize uh, from, from Oaxaca and what we have learned about, uh, about their ability to associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria. And then I'm gonna talk about what we're doing now uh, with colleagues uh, in, in Wisconsin, uh, Claudia Calderon or Natalia De Leon, uh, Sean Kettler here, what we're doing to, um, to try to use that um, knowledge and, and uh, have more practical applications and also advance the knowledge. So um, nitrogen fixation, I told you, can be done in three different ways. You have the, the, the lightnings, that atmospheric fixation, and that uh, is relatively minor. It contributes to less than 10 million tons of nitrogen fixed per year. Uh, biological nitrogen fixation that happens on land and in particular with these legumes and rhizobia systems, 90 to 140 million tons per year. Um, I'm not, I'm excluding what happens in the oceans there. And, and then that process, Haber Bosch process that I was um, referring to um, these days, in fact, now surpasses uh, the amount of biological nitrogen fixation uh, on, on land. Um, as you can see, it's estimated about 170 million tons of nitrogen um, uh, fixed per, per year. So if you think that it's a process which has been, again, invented at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, fairly recently, um, you can see right away that that is going to cause a major, major disruption in the nitrogen cycle um, uh, on land in particular. So that graph is a very simplified graph coming from, from, from that paper published in Nature Geosciences, but it's showing what, I'm, what I took from that is are basically two, two things. So here what you see is um, the, it, in red, it represents the increase of, of the world population over time since the beginning of the 20th century. And in blue, it's an estimate, difficult estimate, but still um, estimate of the proportion of the, of the that population which is fed uh, using synthetic fertilizers. As I said, that technique was uh, invented at the beginning of the 20th century, but really started to be very uh, used a lot uh, during the Green Revolution in the 1950s, 1960s. And today we estimate that about half of the world uh, is, um, is fed through the use of synthetic fertilizers. So that obviously represents uh, a significant uh, fraction of the population. So synthetic fertilizers, first I would say, are a good thing. They are literally feeding, helping to feed about half of the world. Um, but there are also some issues associated with their intensive use. Um, that chemical process of, of that Haber-Bosch process um, that takes the dinitrogen molecule to produce ammonium requires a lot of energy. And that energy in that process comes from natural gas. So it's a fossil fuel that we are using to produce fertilizers. You need about one ton of natural gas to produce one ton of fertilizer. Uh, it's a very signif significant fraction of, of the bio of, of natural gas that we use across the world to produce synthetic fertilizers. And then we use these fertilizers to grow our crops for food, feed, fiber, and, and biofuel production. So first, when you think that we are literally probably feeding about half of the world um, based on fertilizers, now, what that really means is that we are feeding half of the world on natural gas, on, on a non-renewable resource. So right away you can see that the system is just not sustainable, and we all know that. Um, 
when we think that we are using sometimes fertilizers to grow crops, plants for biofuel production, there it's, I would say, almost ironic. We are using natural gas to produce biofuel. So there, it's clearly not, not efficient at all. Um, besides these long-term sustainability and or efficiency issues, there are also some issues that are more region specific, I would say, um, there are additional issues. In developing countries, um, their problem is producing enough food and, and the cost of fertilizer and uh, is often limiting. In fact, what that map shows here in red and blue are places in the world where nutrients are limiting and in particular where nitrogen is limiting. So there are still unfortunately many places in the world where people don't have enough nitrogen. And the cost of fertilizer or which is even more frustrating, the, the logistics of bringing bags of fertilizers to poor growers is often limiting. Um, I highly recommend that book from Roger Thoreau, The, the Last Hunger Season, because it really shows very well the, the two issues of not only the cost, uh, but also just the logistics of bringing that fertilizers to the poor um, farmers, in, in that case, it's in Kenya. So the problem for developing countries is not enough nitrogen. The problem in developed countries and sometimes also in, in developing countries is that sometimes we have too much nitrogen. And you probably have heard about the issues of nitrate leaching, um, especially here in the case of the Midwest, where uh, we have a lot of nitrogen, excess nitrogen fertilizer that ends up in, in groundwater and streams, and ultimately that ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And that leads, leads to the uh, uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, where basically where um, algae are blooming, consuming oxygen and, and killing um, every wildlife, the wildlife. So um, these issues of degradation of coastal zone, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, are, are directly related to the intensive use of fertilizer in the Midwest. And then you also have the issue of global warming, because these, um, some of these fertilizers are also, the, the ones that are not used by the crop are also degraded into greenhouse gases and they contribute to global warming. So because of all these issues, and it's not recent, um, the, uh, the scientific community realized that we need to rely more on microbes and on uh, biological nitrogen fixation to provide nitrogen to our crops, and as I said, in particular, in, in cereals. So I'm, not, I'm sorry for the complicated figure, but uh, I, I, I want to use, so the, the process of biological nitrogen fixation is performed by a comp an enzyme complex that we call the nitrogenase complex. And by the way, UW Medicine for decades has been the center of research on the, on the nitrogenase complex. Um, there is actually, of, if, if, uh, in fact, still officially uh, a nitrogen fixation institute in medicine. Um, because of all the leaders in the, the 70s, 80s, and early 90s uh, uh, stu uh, studying the biochemistry of, of nitrogen fixation were actually here in medicine. So there is a long history here of research on, 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 natu on, on biological nitrogen fixation. So I'm showing you that, that the, the, a picture of that enzymatic complex to show you two issues that are typically associated with, um, with, with biological nitrogen fixation. Uh, one of them, I actually already mentioned it, is the fact that that chemical reaction of breaking the dinitrogen into ammonium requires a lot of energy. And in biological systems, um, that energy comes from ATP. So you need at least 16 molecules of ATP per molecule of dinitrogen, and uh, it's at least. And so it means that the, the bacteria that perform nitrogen fixation, fixation need a lot of energy. And that's often the limiting point in, uh, for, for uh, nat biological nitrogen fixation to happen is provide a, a, an abundant source of energy to the bacteria so that they can fix nitrogen. And the second issue is due to the nature of, of that, the structure of that complex that contains these iron cofactors and that can be oxidized very easily by oxygen. And so uh, oxygen is um, um, an, a strong inhibitor uh, of, of that nitrogenase complex. And so in any efficient biological nitrogen fixation system, um, you need to find a way to protect the nitrogenase complex or the bacteria from, from oxygen. In legumes, it happens by um, a plant protein that we call the leg hemoglobin. I don't know if you already pulled up a, a legume plant and looked at what we call the nodules on the roots. They are all red because of that leg hemoglobin. 
the goal of that process is to protect the nitrogenase against oxygen. And so uh, finding a, a niche, a place uh, on the plant or close to the plant where uh, the bacteria both receive a lot of energy and uh, a low oxygen environment is a struggle. And, and that's, I'm gonna come back on that in a minute. I mean, later. Um, so there, as I said, there has been a lot of research uh, around the world for, and for decades on trying to improve nitrogen fixation in cereals. And some, I'm still continuing some of that, that line of research in my lab. Uh, approaches that are sometimes based on the microbe. Uh, we sometimes try to explore natural microbial diversity. Can we find better microbes that would fix more on, on, on cereals? Uh, the recent, more recent approach is engineering, um, genetic engineering of these microbes. And, and that seems to, that's, there are some promising avenues there. The other approaches are more based on the plant. Uh, can we improve the plant? Can we make our can we make our crops be better hosts for these nitrogen fixing bacteria? And here what I'm showing you are examples of these nodules, that root nodules that happen on, on legume roots. They're pinkish color, uh, characteristic of leg hemoglobin. Um, there are several projects, uh, including one I'm part of, funded by the DOE here in the US, of taking that mechanism from legumes and putting that into cereals. That's great, but that's really long term. Uh, we, well, we estimate like when we're gonna be able to do that. So 20 years, 30 years, that's really long term. There are also, also some approaches which are even more long term of taking that nitrogenase complex I showed you before and genetically put that into plants so that we don't even need a microbe, which would be great, but it's even more longer term. And so uh, our idea uh, that with uh, colleagues in particular at UC Davis uh, was to um, take another route to explore natu natural diversity, but not on the microbial side that as it has been done for decades, but more on, on the plant side. In fact, for me, that idea of looking at plant diversity came from reading a, a review from Eric Triplett, uh, Dr. Eric Triplett. I don't know if uh, some of you know him, but he was here uh, for a long time uh, in the Department of Agronomy. Um, and in 1996, Eric uh, wrote a review where he says that the development first, he highlights again the importance of, of that, I, of finding, of improving biological natural, natural fixation in, in, in cereals. He said, the development of nitrogen fixation in maize can be considered a holy grail of nitrogen fixation research as nitrogen fertilization is one of the highest costs of corn production the development of a symbiosis between diazotrophic bacteria, which means nitrogen fixing bacteria, and corn would be of enormous, enormous uh, economic value. And so his idea that he was um, putting forward in, in that review was natural diversity, but more on, 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 on the bacterial side. He was saying it may be necessary to isolate maize diazotrophic endophytes uh, from many locations, including areas uh, of maize origin in Mexico. And to be honest, that's where, <laughs> that's one of the, the sentences that makes me, made me think, okay, well, isolating microbes, we have been doing that for a while, but what about looking at the plant? Can we explore the diversity of maize, knowing that maize is extremely diverse, um, and, and go back to Mexico to the center of origin of, of domestication of maize and look for maize diversity? And so um, that was our idea. And um, I actually, had, I talked about that idea. I mean, I tried to get that idea funded by federal agencies um, at the beginning of my career here. It never got funded, it was too crazy. Um, but it turns out that the Mars company, um, uh, you know, the chocolate bars, uh, Mars was uh, interested. And actually we started a collaboration with the Mars company and colleagues at UC Davis um, to explore that, that possibility. So as I said, from a genetic standpoint, maize is actually first an outstanding model. Uh, it's a great crop, but it's also extremely diverse. And so that's, that's why also why maize was a really good candidate. As you know, uh, maize is a really important component of uh, the food, in, uh, food, uh, food source in, in Mesoamerica, and not only a food source, but also a very important part of the culture in many, many different aspects. And so uh, the idea was to go to the center of 
diversity and origin of domestication of maize and, and, and see if we could find some of, some of these maize accessions or what we call land races that would associate better than our current crops with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So that's basically what I'm going to tell you about our discovery and, and, what, and the collaboration that we started with, with um, in fact, one village in particular in, uh, in Oaxaca. So long story short, uh, fairly quickly in the project, we got some very promising data that I'm going to show you uh, that were coming from one, one village in, in, this, in the mountains of the Sierra Mije in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And so the, the, the maize land or accessions that we started focusing on are grown here. <laughs> that these are literally the fields where uh, we got the first samples from uh, uh, the, first, the first samples. And uh, the maize there is grown on the slope of the mountain. The soil is extremely poor in nitrogen, um, both because it rains a lot and, uh, and all the nitrogen is leached, but it's also on the slope of the mountain. And uh, another kind of criteria that we had in our search was a place where people grow maize in um, without fertilizers, without using synthetic fertilizers. And so um, that village of Totontepec is um, 1500 to 2000 meters above sea level. So again, it's in the mountains and maize is grown on the slope of, of that, these mountains. Totontepec is also a, a tropical region. So, and it's a very humid climate. Um, it, humidity is above 80% most of the time and it rains several times uh, per week. So here it's actually Pablo who conducted the first experiments, who, um, who <laughs> even told us <laughs> right away he was surprised how rainy, uh, rainy and humid it was. Um, temperature is fairly constant uh, throughout the year between 25 to 30 degrees. And uh, an obvious kind of striking feature of that maize is that it's, um, these are giant maize varieties that people use uh, traditionally in that village. Um, it's, it's, uh, these accessions are uh, about five, sometimes even six meter uh, tall. So if you take what we call a, a tall maize in, in the US, uh, you double it and uh, these are huge plants. Uh, the people that you see here in the field, uh, I used to say they are not kids, they are adults and standing in the field. And again, you have plants that are five, six meter tall. Um, the plants also grow are planted in April and harvested in November. So it's an eight to nine month growing season, which is typical for the tropics, but much longer than what we can do here in, in the Midwest. Uh, if you wonder about the kind of what the plants or the seeds and the, 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 the cobs look like, that's one example here. Um, the yield is not extremely high, but not terrible either. It's basically, it's the corn that they use, their, their everyday corn literally in, in Totontepec. So before I go further, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on how we evaluate nitrogen fixation, at least one of the techniques that we use, and it's called 15N natural abundance, or, and that's the technique that we used uh, in Totontepec for our initial screen. The idea here is that um, you have always some nitrogen in, in the, uh, sorry, you have first two isotopes of nitrogen, what we call 14N, which is the most abundant isotope, and 15N, it's a heavy isotope. It's a, it's a stable isotope, it's not radioactive. And in, in every soil, you have that ratio of 14N, or everywhere, you have a ratio of 14N and 15N, but in soils, you usually have uh, a little bit more, you have more 15N in the soil than in the air. And that's what it's showing here is that in, in a typical soil, you have much more 15N, sorry, than in, in the air. The idea here is that if you have a plant which is, uh, fix, which is not fixing nitrogen, let's say most plants, as I said, take their nitrogen from the soil. And so the, the 15N content of a normal plant that doesn't fix nitrogen, a normal corn plant, if you want, uh, is gonna be the same 15N content as the one in the soil, if that makes sense here. The plant content is the same as the soil. When you have a plant that can fix nitrogen uh, associated with these bacteria, it's getting nitrogen from the air. And so in the, and in the air, you have far less 15N. And so in a plant which is fixing nitrogen, like here in that example of a legume, the, that plant will have a lower 15N content 
because it's taking part of its nitrogen from the air and not only the soil. And so that decrease in 15N content is what, what we use um, as a way to quantify uh, uh, nitrogen fixation in the field. Um, if you grow, let's say even that, um, and, and the extreme case, if you don't take a, a real soil, uh, and if you take just sand that will have no nitrogen at all, a legume will have uh, will, will not have almost will, will not have any nitro, any 15N because it would take all its nitrogen from the air. There would be no 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 15N in the soil, and no, and so that value of what we call delta 15N would would be zero. So that's the technique that we are current that we used initially as our screen to look at maize uh, to look at potentially nitrogen fixation in in corn in Totontepec. So these are these. Um, again, uh, based on, uh, on, the, on just leaf sample that we collect, um, that we can collect in the field, as well as sometimes we also take soil samples. Um, we use that technique of 15N dilution. Um, and right away at the beginning of the project, data came back from Pablo who uh, was, was exploring different places in, in Oaxaca. And uh, in 2010, Pablo got data from Totontepec that were very surprising. And they are here in red. And at the time, we did not know what to expect. So we only took one, one time point during the season. And uh, already in 2010, we got some data that potentially that maize from Totontepec was getting about, as you can see here, that's the percentage of nitrogen coming from the air. It was suggesting that that maize from Totontepec was getting about half of its nitrogen from the air, which is, I would say, um, very, very high. <laughs> if you take a regular corn plant here in the Midwest or all the, the other pl uh, maize plants that we sampled everywhere, you get values that are less than 1%. Um, here, these plants were showing apparently 50% of nitrogen coming from the air. The legumes I was telling you about, you know, soybeans, when you do that kind of experiment on soybean, soybeans are in the range of 60, 70% of nitrogen, nitrogen coming from the air. So it was almost as good as the soybean and, and much more than anything, I mean, anything I had seen on, on, on a cereal, in any cereal. So we came back to Totontepec. Uh, in fact, Pablo and, and his wife lived in Totontepec for, uh, for a while. And so they, uh, we took more samples in 2011 and 2012. And what these data show is that for during about four months during the growing season, uh, about starting at three months for post planting up to six months, we see that these plants get about half, 50% or sometimes more of their nitrogen from the air. Again, for a cereal, any cereal and corn in particular, it's, it's, um, it was surprising. So one issue with these experiments is that uh, these techniques also have potential pitfalls. And so quite frankly, when the data came initially, I was more thinking it has to be an artifact. It cannot be true because again, a regular corn plant is as less, less than 1%. So before I go further, um, I need to tell you a bit more about something surprising when you, see, uh, when you see these plants, is that they produce lots of what we call aerial roots. So you, you may have seen in the field uh, what we call the, the brace roots at the base of, of corn plants that are these finger-like roots that are at the base of the plant that uh, go back to the ground well, these plants from, from Oaxaca, they, they, are not only, they not only have these roots at the base, but they are covered with roots. They can have 10, sometimes even 12 nodes with these finger-like like, like roots. So they, they form a lot of these uh, aerial roots, and as you can see, my kids love them. Um, what we showed is that uh, here, it's a comparison between uh, corn from maize from Totontepec to Another, we took another giant corn that we had in the lab. It's called Hickory King. It's grown in, grown in Brazil. And Hickory King is also a giant corn. So we wanted to have a, a fair point of comparison. And so what we see here is that the, oops, sorry, in Hickory King, like in, in any kind of regular maize plants that we are used to, um, you have about here, that's the number of nodes with roots. Um, you have about two or three nodes of, uh, of roots at the base. And these roots are, brace roots are known for anchorage of the plant. But in the, the varieties of, from Totontepec, we see here in that experiment, it was eight, nine roots, uh, nodes with roots. But we also have some, I mean, from more recent experiments where 
we are reaching 12 nodes with roots. And uh, if you count the number, total number of, of roots you have on these plants, you have, let's say, 30 on, on Hikori King, um, but you have more than 100 on, on these varieties from Tutontepec. The main difference we think that happens between the, these, um, um, these varieties from Tutontepec and, and more conventional maize is that in, in conventional maize that we grow here in the US, um, these aerial roots are just produced during what we call the juvenile phase. And when the plants transition to the adult phase, they stop producing these roots. In these accession from the Sierra Mihe, um, the roots are produced during the juvenile phase and the adult vegetative stage. And then they, the plants stop producing um, these roots at flowering time, what we call tasseling in, in, in maize. So that's what we think is the sort of one of the major differences between most of the varieties that we're used to and, and these varieties. They keep producing roots even at the adult stage. Another striking feature of these plants when you, when you see them, especially after rain, is that when it rains, when these roots are exposed to, um, when, well, when it rains on these roots, um, they are gonna start producing a lot of gel. We call that a mucilage or mucigel. And um, one, a single of these roots produces between 1.5 to 2 milliliters of gel. And it's a pretty striking feature when you, if you go to the field after, let's say here, half an hour after rain, you see the roots, all these roots dripping with gel. So as for, for a biologist, that was surprising. So that's why when we started looking into these varieties of maize um, here in Wisconsin, we started looking at different parts of the plant using another technique to evaluate um, nitrogen, what we call nitrogenous activity, you know, the activity of that enzyme. We looked at the leaf, we looked at the stem, at the underground roots of the maize. Uh, we see a little bit of natural fixation happening like in any, any corn, but it's tiny. And then these aerial roots, the roots on the stem before rain without gel and after rain when they're covered with gel. And the way we see that when the roots are covered with the gel, they, uh, we detect a very strong nitrogenous activity, meaning that, that you have bacteria inside of that gel that fix nitrogen very efficiently. For, for by, by comparison, the, the race here, that's the nitrogenous activity for one root, one of these roots, and it's not far from the nitrogenous activity that we get from an alfalfa plant or legume plant when we do the same assay. So it's very, very high rates. So at that point, I started to think, yes, there is something unusual. And from these data in particular, we started focusing on what's happening in the gel produced by, by, these, uh, by these plants. So one difficulty that I have in my field of research of nitrogen fixation is that we have many techniques, but all our techniques have potential pitfalls. Um, I told you that we started with 15 N natural abundance. I just showed you these, um, what we call acetylene reduction assay to measure the nitrogen as activity. But we have more techniques, 15 N dilution, which is a variation of natural abundance, gas enrichment, it's sort of the reverse kind of experiment, and then nitrogen balance. All these techniques have potential pitfalls, and that, so that's why uh, in, a, in my field, strong evidence only comes from having uh, different techniques pointing to in the same direction. Because our, our claim on, on that maze was a bit outrageous or was very surprising, uh, for that project, we literally used all of them. And so if you want to look up uh, the paper, it's uh, open access and the data have been published in, in PLOS Biology in, in 2018. By the way, I don't know any other paper in my field that used all the techniques. <laughs> so, um, as I said, natural fixation is done by bacteria. And um, we looked at what are the bacteria, and in particular, what are the bacteria in that, in that gel, in that mucilage. And so we did approaches of looking at what we call the microbiome, uh, using 16S amplicon sequencing, shotgun metagenomics, isolating microbes, and sequencing genomes. Again, some of it is in the paper, and some we are still working on it. We think that the gel itself is a really critical, essential component of, of the system. We have really good evidence that basically the more gel is produced by, by these maize accessions, the more fixation happens. Um, we know that the gel is degraded. So we, we know that the gel is first a polysaccharide of galactose with a galactose backbone with um, lots of substitutions of fucose, arabinose, xylose, uh, we know that that polysaccharide is degraded into simple sugars and that these sugars are used by, in particular, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria to fuel the nitrogenase activity. 
if you remember what I said at the beginning, that one of the limiting steps is often to feed, to feed these bacteria to provide a source of energy, while the sugars in the gel are doing that. Um, the viscosity of, gel, of the gel also slows down oxygen diffusion and so helps providing that micro aerobic, microoxic environment inside of the gel to protect the nitrogenase. And also the, the gel is sitting on the root and these roots take up nitrogen very efficiently. And we did labeling experiments by here by putting what we call 15N ammonium or 15N nitrate and we see that nitrogen taken up very quickly by the plant. And so, so, so the gel is also a low nitrogen environment for the bacteria. So initially I told you that we started with, um, uh, with, with that collaboration with uh, the village of Totontepec. Um, so the, the project was funded by, by the Mars company. And the Mars company uh, had developed an agreement with the village of Totontepec and um, and I was getting my, my, my seeds directly from Totontepec via that agreement with Mars. The Mars company is a company and they tried to patent the trade and they uh, failed in, in, in patenting the trade, meaning they were not able to patent the trade, which I think is a good thing. Um, and the, their patent has been rejected because it's a natural, tra natural trait of, of maize that they were trying to put into other maize varieties. And so, uh, fortunately, these days, the, the, the regulations are stricter in terms of patenting natural traits. So in about 2017, 2018, um, May, uh, the Mars company, uh, seeing that they would not be able to patent the trait and decided to stop the project. Um, quite frankly, I, I was relieved <laughs> in many ways. Uh, first, because we, uh, that also meant that they allowed us to finally publish what we were doing but also because I had a, a strong concern. Um, even when I was working with Mars and with Pablo, who was uh, funded by Mars, was in Totontepec, um, I asked Pablo to look around and in other villages around. And once we knew what the basis of the trait was, let's say at the beginning, we had no idea. We even didn't think that we were gonna find anything. But once we knew that, well, something unique or something unusual was happening in that maze. But most of all, once we knew that it had to do with these roots and the gel produced by the roots, I asked Pablo to look around and to go in other villages around and see if there, there was a maze that had the same feature of many roots and gel. And sure enough, uh, he started telling me, oh yeah, and he found more <laughs> maize with the same properties around. Just by chance, we did not go to these other places and villages. So the fact that the agreement with Mars was only with the village of Totontepec uh, was bothering me seriously. And in fact, Mars prevented me from working with maize from other accessions, from other locations. So when in 2017, 2018, that uh, the, the company stopped funding the project, uh, I decided to stop using the material they provided and start fresh, <laughs> I would say, and also start on a, uh, using material which is publicly available. And in particular, we started collaborating. Uh, that's when <clears throat> Claudia Calderon is here and uh, also Natalia De Leon started helping me to, uh, to um, try to do an, another screen of, of maize uh, accessions, starting from public collections. And in particular, we started using collaborating with the CIMIT um, based in Mexico. They are the International Maize and Wheat Improvement and Stock Center. Uh, their material is publicly available. And we started collaborating with them and looking for maize that had the features that I just told you about, having many roots and thick roots producing a lot of gel when it rains. And what we found <clears throat> in our screen is that not only, well, first <laughs> uh, confirmation, we, we, we found some accessions coming from Totontepec, which was not so surprising, but also from other places around in the, in the mountains of the Sierra Mije. And uh, also uh, accessions that were coming from the lowlands, not only in the mountains, which for me was a surprise because I, I would not explain but I, in more detail, but we had a hypothesis that the trait was maybe linked to altitude, uh, maize grown in, in the highlands. Apparently, no, the trait is also found in, in maize grown in, in the lowlands. And so um, clearly the trait is not unique to Totontepec, uh, it's present throughout, throughout the region. Um, more than just in cultivated maize, uh, what we found is that uh, uh, the trait of that I just described uh, with many roots and the gel 
is also present in some what we call teosinte plants. So maize got domesticated from uh, wild plants called teosinte, and in particular for one of them called teosinte parviglumis. Well, it turns out that teosinte parviglumis itself, so here it's my, my, my pointer here at the bottom, teosinte parviglumis, uh, most of the maize that we grow comes from domesticated teosinte parviglumis. But there are, and also other teosinte species in the region, um, we did not find the trait of natural fixation in, in teosinte parviglumis. Uh, which explains, by the way, why most of the accessions that we use in the U.S. don't have the trait. But the trait uh, with the roots and the gel and natural fixation is present in other teosinte species. And already researchers had found that there has been what we call introgression of, of genes from other teosinte species into early domesticated corn. And so for what I did, I started looking, we started looking at what we call teosinte mexicana. And in teosinte mexicana, you have many, many nodes with roots, and these roots produce gel. These roots are not very thick, which is a different from, from, from the maize that we characterize. But still, the trait of high number of nodes with roots is there. And we, we use some of these ARA assays, actually, before, to show that basically we have good ARA activity in, in the gel produced by these uh, Teosante Mexicana plants, and, and that in the gel, you also have low oxygen level. Um, here, what I'm showing you is that white you can have these crosses between teosante and, and maize so that literally in, in when you in mexico you can have a maize plant and in these teosante mexicana or teosante plants grown side by side and so you can have cross pollination um, more recently with claudia calderon in particular we, we uh, claudia, uh, claudia has a, a nice collection of of teosante plants and it seems that the trait is not only in teosante mexicana but probably in other teosante species the point here is that the trait at least a lot of the trait predates domestication, and but there, there has been this introgression from wild teosante into, into uh, domesticated corn. I just wanted to show you that picture also um, because I think it's pretty striking. Uh, it's, um, these are pictures or drawings of maize plants uh, from 1581. So in that herbal um, called of lobel, um, that's what maize looks like. So in the 16th century, when, you, when these are first Europeans when, uh, came to America, that's what they described as being corn. As you can see, it's quite different from the corn we grow here. And in particular, look, it has exactly all these nodes with roots, very similar to, uh, very similar to exactly what I, I showed you before. So, um, so the trait is present in, in well, I'd say, in, in, in plants before domestication and throughout the region. With even broader, more broadly, what we found is that we found exactly the same trait in sorghum, an, another cereal, which is quite different from, from corn. Uh, sorghum got domesticated from Africa, in Africa, but sorghum also has exactly the same trait. It turns out that in 1986, some colleagues had some primary data uh, showing that already in, uh, and that they actually showed in that picture of, for, uh, from an abstract book of a conference on serial nutrient fixation, uh, they already found some fixation happening in, on, this, on these roots produced, uh, these aerial roots produced by sorghum and the gel they produced. It turns out that in 1986, that project did not convince anybody. They did not get funding to continue the project. And that project died uh, in 1986. So basically what we did is that we rediscovered something that colleagues already saw in the 1980s in sorghum. So briefly, we now came back to sorghum and worked again with colleagues at the ICRISAT. And indeed, you can see exactly the same phenotype on some accessions of sorghum. So the trait is not unique to maize, it's also in sorghum. The last piece of, of, of data I wanted to show are these ones that not only the trait is seen in these plants the, of the, from the Sierra Mije, but they can be transferred by, by crossing uh, the plants. So these are, that's, these are data from a technique called 15N dilution, where when you have high 15N content, it means no fixation. Low 15N content here, that, that, as in these accession from the Sierra Mije, indicates fixation. And these plants here on the left, on the far left, are crosses, the result of crosses between the Sierra Mije accessions and these, what we call inbreds, classical inbreds used in the Midwest. And as you can see, what you have is, is a, what we call a segregation of the trait. You, you have some plants that, in that progeny that don't fix nitrogen, but 
some of them display pretty good rates of nutrient fixation, indicative that just by crossing the plants, you can transform the trait, transfer the trait from these plants from the Sierra Mije into uh, vari varieties that we use here. So initially that work was done with Mars, but now we are basically continuing in particular with Claudia Calderon and Natalia De Leon and Sean Kepler here. Uh, we are continuing that work using accessions from, from the CIMIT and, and uh, the work is um, funded by USDA. All right, um, we, I'm sorry for taking a bit too much time. I'm just gonna finish by, by telling you about what we're doing right now, what our, what our, what our, our current directions and, and why we think that connects to the Wisconsin idea. First, we want to know a bit more about the limits of the trait. We want to, as I told you, we know that the trait requires water and humidity. We want to evaluate how much water is really necessary to get good fixation. We want to look at the effect of nutrients in the soil. Um, uh, is that like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, how does that affect nitrogen fixation in, in these plants? As I said, in, in Totontepec, they grow their corn under very low nutrient conditions. Uh, we want to see if uh, what's the effect of, of nutrients on the trait. And um, one worry that we have, quite frankly, about the trait is that, well, it requires, you know, the production of the gel and all these roots, and we want to uh, evaluate, is there an impact of that trait on, on yield? And at this point, um, yeah, so I, will, I, can, I can explain if you want more. Uh, the second aspect is, is genetics. We want to identify what are the genes that control the traits, the, these, or that these, uh, what are the genes that control the fact that you have all these nodes with roots, what we don't have in our current classical corn. Uh, what are the genes contro controlling the thickness of the root that we know correlates a lot with the amount of gel which is produced. Of course, what are the genes controlling nitrogen fixation in, in general? And also, where are these genes coming from? Uh, as I told you, some of these genes very likely come from Teosinte, um, like Teosinte mexicana, but maybe also other, other Teosinte species. And what has been the contribution of, of, of these crosses with Teosinte and, and the contribution potentially also of domestication? What has been the influence of, of people maybe over hundreds of years uh, in selecting for that trait? We want to characterize the microbes, and so we want to isolate, continue our what we call metagenomics, isolate microbes, create what we call synthetic communities. Uh, I'm working on, on that project with Ophelia Ventura Lee here in, in biochemistry. Can we genetically uh, improve these natural fixing bacteria? Can we develop what we call inoculants that would help growers uh, even in, 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 in Oaxaca to get even to take better advantage of, of nitrogen fixation because we know that sometimes the, the availability of, of the, the proper nitrogen fixing bacteria is limiting. Can we, can we add nitrogen fixing bacteria and, and improve the system? And then finally, um, introduce the trait into uh, varieties that can be used across the world. As I told you, one of the features of that maze when you see it is the size. And these plants are five meters tall and they are not they're not really, I mean, it's not the kind of maize which is grown uh, acro across the world. So if we want to use that, that maize in the Midwest or quite frankly in most places around the world, uh, we need to have plants that have a more conventional size. We need to have plants that don't grow over nine months, but in a shorter growing season. So clearly, can we breed for the trait? Can we introduce the trait by, by, by crosses and and develop varieties that would be useful for growers in, in Wisconsin, in the Midwest, but quite frankly also around the world. Because as I said in my introduction, we know that nitrogen is limiting in many places around the world and in particular in, in developing countries. Can we develop varieties that would basically self-fertilize for people who don't have access to fertilizer? Um, and, and that's quite frankly my main motivation these days is, and I think that's probably the first even use of that trait would be for developing countries. And the last aspect is, um, can we work with growers in, in, in particular in Oaxaca or in Mexico uh, to try to guide the breeding process uh, that they are doing themselves? Because people naturally are doing breeding. And, and so can we work, can we do that participatory breeding with uh, growers in Mesoamerica to guide and to help them breeding themselves uh, for, for the trait? Um, a bigger picture of, of, that, of that aspect is we, without people grow, using that trait in Totontepec, we would have never found it. Uh, 
What are the ways we can return benefits to these people? What are the benefits they want? All these are for us important questions that we want to, we want to continue to have a discussion. The, the people that you, can, that you see on that picture, they're actually the, the, the four people who are sending me seeds uh, for years and years. Uh, in fact, I was labeling my, my seeds with their name. I mean, I was doing experiments with seeds from Vicente or from, from Carmita, and they, were, they are the, the people who helped us doing that research. What kind of benefit we can return, not only to these people in particular, but to their community more broadly. All right, I'd like to finish and, 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 and uh, acknowledge um, people who, uh, the team first. Uh, as I said, we are funded uh, by USDA for some aspects of the project, not all. Not, uh, we are still looking for funding to do the breeding in particular. We are not funded to do the breeding, which is the last aspect and, and a really important one. Uh, Claudia Calderon in the Department of Horticulture is a great collaborator, not only for the genetics, because she's an amazing geneticist, but also for, for these more um, social aspects and cultural aspects. Um, Natalia De Leon and Sean Kepler, great corn geneticists, and Je Jason Wallace, a, a, a colleague from the University of Georgia, who also has expertise in these plant microbe interactions. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for taking probably a bit too much time and I would be glad to answer any questions.